So today we're really going to dive into the details of how you work in TensorFlow. And we'll go through some examples of that. But before we get into the code, we went over this last class. I'll just breeze through it, the first part at least. But when you set up your neural network for your homeworks or your final project, there's a lot of things you need to consider, right? It's a compact amount of code you'll write. Something like 50 lines will get you to where you're like reading in data and training a network. But there's a lot to consider within those. There are three categories to consider. One is architectural decisions. These are how the network is statically constructed. We'll learn all these terms today. Then once you hit go, click execute, there's decisions on how the process of utilizing that static network to optimize for your particular machine learning goal are executed, right? Those are primarily driven by the loss function and type of optimization you're telling TensorFlow to execute, right? So more often than not, when you encounter problems, it's generally on the right side of the screen that are going to be your easiest things to change to seek solutions. And then the last category is down at the bottom, other specifics. So there's small things you can add or change within your neural network to get better performance, which we'll cover mostly next class. Obvious concept to really learn in detail or just make sure we're clear about is how the convolutional neural networks will design use convolutions. So we just went through this last class. And I'll remember it starts in the upper left-hand corner and the filter slides across until it hits the edge of the image. And so it's not like the standard convolution operation that NumPy uses. And the size of the output will be less than the size of the input in general following this formula. You can add to make it an integer. And then we stopped here. This is where things get one more dimension of thought, let's just say, where in neural networks, deep neural networks, generally we're working with three or actually four dimensional data cubes. Everything before we've talked about convolutions applied to 2D images, you have to take that idea and just extend it a little bit to the third dimension. So what that means is our convolutional uh, filters will now be three dimensional arrays. Uh, why? Well, A, because or you may have color images. You could account for those color channels um, by using this three dimensional uh, set of weights instead of a two dimensional set of weights. But more importantly, we will be creating additional channels. And so if you have two different convolutional filters you're optimizing for, then the output of applying each of those filters individually to your image will be a separate result. Right? The values within them will be the lead to different outputs. How many channels do you create? That's an architectural decision. So it's really up to you. Generally, it's a freedom. It's something you're completely free to choose. So here, one could choose, let's say, six channels to create at their first layer. Right. One image turns into six, effectively. This concept is really important because it won't go away. It'll persist throughout all of the networks we discuss. And it's just, yeah, it's something that you eventually take for granted, but perhaps when you first encounter it, it might be a little confusing to think about. All right, so that leads to pictures shown below. Here we have an input 64 by 64 pixel image with three color channels. And I'm saying we're gonna apply a five by five by three filter with six channels to it. So what might be the size of that data matrix? So the answer is 60 by 60 by six, just like shown at the top. You apply that n minus f over one formula to get the spatial dimensions. And then I said there's six channels. Six channels leads to the sixth dimension along the third axis. OK, so now we have a 5 by 5 by 6 filter. So note, yeah, this is important. When you have a, now our, we have a six channel data cube after our first layer. When we do a convolution on it, we need to use a convolution filter that has six, generally, 
people use convolutional filters that have six along that third dimension. And so you'll see the filters here, there are six prescribed along the third dimension. The other two dimensions are, again, completely up to us. But here I'm saying we have a five by five by six filter. And we're going to now uh, have 10 channels. So what's the size of this data matrix? Anyone want to give me one or two or three of the dimensions? 56 by 56 by 10. That's right. OK, great. So you apply the n minus f over 1, filter again, and that's what you get. The 10 is because there's 10 channels. So if I said 5 by 5 by 6 filter, stride equals 2, then the dimensions there would have decreased significantly. It would be 32, I'm pretty sure. If you want to reduce the spatial dimension of your image, and which is something you want to design your networks to do as you go along layer by layer towards the output, then you can apply stride equals twos or stride equals threes even to help achieve that goal. Right here, we haven't materially reduced the spatial dimensions too much. We started off with 64, we're down to 56, which isn't that much less. But as you go along and add channels, it's a general design choice to shrink the spatial dimensions with stride twos. All right, any questions about that? So this idea of creating multiple channels on the output, I just want to highlight, because it appears in your homework, is not surprisingly just an extra linear operation. You're not doing anything crazy mathematically. The idea or concept of taking an image and performing multiple convolutions on it with different convolutional filters is easily summarized, again, with the matrix equation. Here I'm drawing a graphical picture of such a matrix, but you can see it's essentially a stacked series of three matrices. Right, so a single output will go through this large, tall matrix and produce an enlarged output, which I'm showing in colors can be separated in three different component. The number of columns needs to match the image coming in, but in general in these neural networks, if they're not the same size, then it's not so easy to put all them together into a single data cube, right? Because if this first channel is let's say 60 by 60, but then this one's 50 by 40, it gets a little unwieldy, I guess, to handle, or it, I, in general, that's not done. But you could try to design a padding scheme to allow for that. Possible. OK, so just remember, yeah, if you want to repeat operations on a single input, matrix stacking is pretty straightforward. Again, because it's going to be in your homework. OK, let's do another example. So here we have input volume. It's a color image. That's 32 by 32 by 3. And we're going to apply 10 unique filters that are each 5 by 5 by 3 with a stride of 1 and a pad of 2. All right, so I'm going to give you guys 20 seconds or so to try to figure out what the first layer's size is going to be. There's three numbers you need to figure out. The first two are the spatial dimensions, right? 32 by 32 with a 5 by 5 filter, but here, note, there's a padding of two, and the stride of one is just the normal case. Yeah, so we know that the third dimension is going to have 10 entries in it, because, again, we're prescribing 10 unique filters. How about the other two? 34, or actually, you're going to have 36, because when you pad it just adds a, a border. There you go. Okay, great. Our new, when you account for padding, our new input volume becomes 36 by 36 by 3, right? So then, when we do this n minus f divided by stride plus 1, you get 36 minus 5 plus 1, which is 32. So the output size, this is kind of useful to highlight how if you want to maintain the size of your image as you go along in TensorFlow, 
which sometimes is a goal, depending on what you're trying to achieve with your network, you can pad. Right, so let's say you wanted to create an, an all convolutional neural network that did segmentation or something like that, right? In that case, you want the number of pixels in your segmentation map to be the same as the image you're starting with. And so you'll want to maintain that through padding as you go along. Because, like we've learned, the TensorFlow defaults to starting the convolution in the upper left and ending in the upper right. And so it'll naturally just keep making your image smaller and smaller unless you do something about it, which is adding some zeros around the edge. Okay, so the next question is, how many weights make up this transformation? When you set up your TensorFlow network, you will you'll define weights that need to be optimized. These are our values of W that in your homework one were part of the linear classification problem. Now they're within convolutional kernels, right? So they're the weights within each filter, rather. So we have 10 unique filters, each are five by five by three. And so what you would guess is how many weights are there? Well, each convolutional filter has its own set of weights. So there's 75, and then there's 10 of them. Each one's unique, right? With your image and then give you an output. They'll be initialized randomly to start, and so they'll give you a funny looking image on the output, but as you iterate, these weights will change and perturb to then give you useful values in this first layer that you're creating. Okay, and so naively you would say, hey, there's 750 values to consider, but something that TensorFlow does under the hood is it also has this scalar offset value, just like you had in your homework, where we said, hey, we're going to solve for W1 and W2, the two weights that are going to draw our classification boundary. We also added a third one, W0, that allows our system to have a scalar offset. And so TensorFlow includes that under the hood. And so for each filter, you'll have the values within the matrix that performs the convolution, and then a single scalar offset that can globally shift the value of the entire operation up and down. Okay? And so that leads to 760 unique weights that TensorFlow will optimize. All right, so what do these filters look like? When you initialize your network, generally we initialize them all randomly so they won't look like anything useful. After you optimize them, the convolutional filters themselves take on certain appearances that are somewhat interpretable at earlier layers but become less interpretable at later, later layers. So here's an example from a paper Rob Fergus did really early on in the convolutional neural network design space. The what are called low-level features are called so because there are parallels between the convolutional operations that are being performed early on in the image analysis process and what our eyes do and our brain does to help us interpret images. Our, very early on in our vision system, we uh, apply similar convolutional filters to help us find edges as we scan our eyes around. So it turns out that neural networks do something similar. Right. Why? We don't know. We didn't prescribe them to do anything like this. But this connects to this idea of forming a dictionary that folks did by hand early on before convolutional neural networks. Right? These different filters effectively offer us a useful basis to then consider further downstream operations on. Right? So this idea of working within a basis of pixels not being optimal, instead transforming that basis into a new coordinate space what transformation should we use? It turns out convolving with a series of little kind of wavelet-like kernels gives us a useful basis to begin to work towards classification. The first layer generally always looks like this if your network is trained well in convolutional neural networks. That's why also downloading pre-trained networks isn't a bad idea, which we'll talk about in later classes, because why retrain all of these weights when someone else or other people have already done that now millions of times, you can just save your comput computation and download these 
because they're going to work pretty well. The next kind of mid-level case, you can see some convolutional filters shown there have some structure, but it's not so interpretable. In the first layers, you can see very clear stripes, horizontal, vertical, diagonal. In the middle layers, not so much, but there still is some spatial stuff going on. You'll also notice that those convolutional filters are larger than in the first layer. That used to be the case. It was a very popular design choice to start with smaller convolutional filters and then go larger. Now it's a little less maintained in a similar convolutional kernel size for multiple layers before you try your fully connected layers later on. And then, yeah, the high, as you go higher level, naturally the, this, this interpretability or the spatial uh, structure of these convolutional filters begins to kind of deteriorate even more. So less and less insight as you go further on. Okay, so I already said this, but this idea of having these filters define a basis and connecting that to biological vision is pretty direct. There's a lot of analysis on that. Okay, and so then what do the resulting convolved images look like? So after a first layer, at the top here, we're seeing, I guess, 32 different convolutional filters. Each of these is color, right? So this is exactly what we were talking about. Each of these is a 5 by 5 by 3 filter. So there's 75 values summarizing each of these little squares. And then in this case, there's 32 of them. They were trained on a task to classify images like this. Let's say there's, I don't know how many categories, maybe this was CIFAR 10. I don't know exactly the data set, but it was trained. And so that's after training. These are the optimized weight values. Uh, and now it's applied to this image. As the first layer, it's gonna take this image and transform it into something that kind of looks like the car still, but you can see all of the different features it pulls out. You can see how this orange shaded filter will, when applied to this color image, highlight, not surprisingly, the orange thing on the uh, front headlight, I'm guessing, of the car and lead to a large white dot there where the blue arrow is, is playing. And so if the goal was to classify images of cars versus helicopters versus boats, which CIFAR 10 is geared towards, then this would probably be a good convolutional filter, right? Because generally, as far as I know, cars do have these orange headlights and most other vehicles don't. It was trained without that insight in mind, but settled on that. And I'm just hypothesizing that is why that may have been one filter. It could be some completely other reason or no reason. <laughs> because it's hard to really get at that. But also I'm highlighting that this first layer is creating 32 individual images, right? So there's, when applied as a first layer, you start with one image and you end up with 32 and they're all stacked together as an independent channel, right? All right, so now let's talk about the nonlinearity. So that's giving you a sense of convolution, what happens and how multiple channels are formed. These images are shown before this nonlinearity. These are just directly the linear convolution outputs. Now, after you do a convolution, we need to apply a nonlinearity, right? Otherwise, we're not gonna get any performance gains, right? We went through the exercise of if you have just a series of linear operations and you repeat many of those, it's still just a linear operation and it's still a linear classifier. So after each of these layers, or within each layer is included a nonlinearity. What are these nonlinearities? Here's the most common ones. There's probably more fancier ones. I don't know, this is an old slide. But these are the most common ones. So sigmoid we've already seen in our derivation of the logistic classifier. That's a traditional nonlinearity from neural network research from the last 60 years or 60 years ago or something. There's the tan h function. It's useful because it just looks like the sigmoid and it's centered at zero. There's the ReLU, which is extremely popular. There's the leaky ReLU, which uh, you can see has a non-zero value 
generally when the function is evaluated with numbers less than zero with negative values. And it, ELU is similar. It doesn't have explicitly a zero value for negative numbers. It has this decay curve. This nonlinear activation function moves values from any number along the x-axis to between zero and one. So it's a probability measure. It has nice mathematical properties to work with. Historically, it was quite popular because if you insert it into some math, it has a lot of useful identities and properties to manipulate and, and, and work with as you go along your way, analyzing neural networks from a theoretical perspective. However, it saturates to zero as we go large and small. So this connects to the question we just had about why do we have this constant offset and what do we have to worry about in neural network design? One of the biggest worries is weights getting too large or too small. So a lot of stuff within TensorFlow is designed to help you achieve this task of keeping weights constrained to be not too large or small. If a weight goes to the right, one weight becomes like 10 or 20, or another one becomes negative 10 or negative 20, then the sigmoid evaluated of that is going to be very similar to the weight being 5 or so, right, or 100, right? And so the information, it'll be squashed to value of being 0.99 or 0.999, but the weight can be dramatically different. That's one issue. The other issue is as you go to the right or left, the bigger issue is the gradient of the sigmoid function goes to zero. So when you then try to do gradient descent, you don't have much gradient to work with. So if all of your weights become large, all of a sudden, for some reason, in a particular layer, then you apply a nonlinearity like the sigmoid, you're out of luck, because all of your gradients have vanished. And then your gradient descent begins to suffer from numerical precision issues, as well as others, because you're cascading these gradient operations down through the network, as we'll learn more about. So that's something that you constantly have to be concerned about. And luckily, TensorFlow, everyone's concerned about that in these types of auto differentiation optimization frameworks. And so TensorFlow has a lot of tools available and just helps you with that task automatically. They keep the values of the weights more towards not too large, not too small as you go about your optimization tasks. So another similar problem with this nonlinearity is it's not zero centered. So if you apply this, let's say in 10 cascaded operations, it'll essentially add 0.5 effectively to each cascaded operation because the mean is 0.5. Of using nonlinearities and applying constant offsets like this value here is to allow the network to pull all the weight values back down towards zero or to try to be mean zero values for your weights to avoid them slowly getting larger and larger or smaller and smaller, which then leads to vanishing gradient issues. The last issue with this is it's expensive to compute. It's this wiggly curve that takes a while if you're applying sigmoid calculations millions of times, or the derivative of the sigmoid. So the TANH does solve this uh, mean offset problem. It's zero centered, which is useful. It keeps the weights from growing too large or too small. Helps with that task. But it still uh, saturates to zero. Right, so if the weights are too big or too small, its gradient is nearly zero. And so that's not great. The ReLU is, solves a lot of these issues, but introduces new issues. <laughs> so it does not saturate its gradient, but only in one direction, right? Its gradient is zero for all negative values. Neg any negative number that comes in, it'll be set to zero, and its gradient will be zero. Right, so it's curious, why is that useful? It turns out it's useful to just kill certain weights and not worry about them if they're not being helpful, right? Note that the gradient for a positive value output is non-zero, right? It is just the value itself, effectively. Or it's one, rather, excuse me. So it's efficient to compute, right? You just take the value and pass it on if it's greater than zero and make it zero otherwise. And then the gradient is just one, right, for positive valued weights. So it's almost like a lookup table like calculation with a lookup table being size two, zero or one. Um, so that's pretty good. And it converges fast, this biologically plausible thing. I didn't write this slide, but 
supposedly it's more biologically plausible. I guess the idea here is in a lot of neuron activation studies, there is just a threshold of stimuli. The neuron won't do anything until a certain threshold is met, and then it'll return whatever the input is, which is what this does, this function does, not surprisingly. The gradient disappears, which is a bigger issue. And so essentially a picture of what happens in a ReLU formatted neural network is shown here. Basically, for any values coming in, here are just some arbitrary two axes, x1, x2. If it's in this positive quadrant, it will pass along a gradient. Whereas any other quadrant, the gradient will disappear. So you'll throw away a lot of weights, right? A lot of the weights within your network will eventually not be working or won't be contributing to the actual optimization task. So that's good and bad, and we'll discuss why later in the class. But so if you really want to avoid this issue and avoid all the bad kind of connotations of killing those weights, then you can simply add a bias to this ReLU, which is what we showed here, leaky ReLU, or the ELU. Both of those are popular alternatives to the ReLU, which avoid this issue. So if you are working with the ReLU, which generally most people do, and then you're running into a bug or encountering an issue and your hypothesis might be that this is the case, that the zero gradient for negative values is killing a lot of weights, then switch it and just see. It just takes, whatever, 10 seconds to change the value, as we'll see in the code, uh, but then you have to wait again. In my experience, it won't make a big difference, and instead you should be more concerned about the type of optimization structure you're choosing, which gradient descent flavor you're, you're working with and things like that. And making sure you have enough data and all of those things. Okay, so onwards, let's talk about pooling. After you apply the nonlinearity, you can take your image and pool it. What does that mean? It essentially means just reducing the spatial dimensions. So one way to reduce the spatial dimensions we already discussed today, that's gonna use the stride of two or three. Um, pooling simply takes values within a two by two grid of the spatial coordinates of your image or the each channel of your image at each layer and selects or averages values. And so max pooling is the most common pooling method as is it takes, looks at the values within a two by two area and selects the max and returns that. And then the next two by two grid, it'll pick the max out of that, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty simple. And it reduces the spatial dimension of your image by two, right? So you're working towards this smaller representation of your input with probably more channels that will then get you towards your classification task where you'll pass it through a fully connected layer. You can also do some pooling or mean pool. Generally, I would say more and more now, people are just using stride of twos or stride of threes uh, to main what's called like an all convolutional neural network. So because it connects to the homework, this pooling operation also is just a linear procedure. You can summarize it as a matrix, right, as well. If you wanted to take a vector and reduce its size by skipping every other value, for example, you just omit every other row in that matrix. So again, just highlighting that because it's on the homework. All right, how many layers do you choose and what should we do with fully connected layers? Again, these are architectural decisions. There's no right or wrong answer. And this is a good time to pause and just go through some code. There's a number of notebooks here. The one I'm going through right now, last or two classes ago, we went through this simple example of running TensorFlow to compute gradients with the gradient.tape. Do you remember that? So now I'm just going through this high level intro. Okay, to start, we just import TensorFlow, right? And so here, as a first step, we're loading MNIST. Start your neural network explorations, right? You need data, right? So one way to get data is to use pre-compiled data sets that are essentially a part of TensorFlow, right? Naturally, that's great. It's one line and you get 60,000 labeled examples. Another useful way is just to import data from Google Drive. Let's say you find 
some data online. You're excited about trying some, whatever you're interested in. A useful way to get uh, data into Colab because Colab's a convenient coding platform, right? You just go to colab.research.google.com um, is to um, use this line of code here. So it says from google.colab import drive. And then you want to mount your drive. So it's this drive.mount. And so then I need to connect to my Google Drive. And I'll choose my account. And I'll say continue. OK, cool. So now I just gave Google permission to get stuff from Google. So they already have all of your information and everything about you anyways. So it doesn't matter that you're allowing Google Colab to access your Google Drive files. Google acquired the company that created Google Colab. So I think that's why that pop-up comes, because there's still some weird, I don't know what's going on with that acquisition or collaboration. But they also, you can't get easily Google credits to use Google Colab. I've tried. They're not helpful. For some reason. So then you can get into your drive using the standard change directories, right? I can CD into any Google Drive thing I want to do. All right, so then I have coordinates, NP, Y file. And so I just imported all this data, right? It's called data file because, just to be clear, you can go to Google Drive and your Google Drive account just has different folders. You can make new folders, you can create a new folder called BME 548, final project data, and then you download a zip file of images that you liked and you pop them in that folder, unzip it and pop them in that folder, or zip it, and then you have to unzip it each time you open it in Google Colab. But then you directory to the folder that data is in and load the data. This mp.load will work for NumPy files, but if it's an image, you can do like an IM read type operation, whatever you need to do to get the data in. Does that make sense? Or you can first just open it in Python, all the images, save it as an MPY file, and then you can load them in just with this command here. This is an easy way for all of you to get data into Google Colab to then begin to exploring and using Colab to process your images for your final project in particular, because for the homework, we'll just give you all the data anyways. All right, so we loaded MNIST. We mean subtracted it just like we did on the homework and normalized it by its standard deviation. We'll see why that's important next class in detail. But here's the, how easy TensorFlow is, right? So I imported TensorFlow as TF, right? That's really the only TensorFlow specific operation we've done so far apart from loading data. So here I'm defining a simple model. And so when we work with TensorFlow, in this class, primarily, we'll use something called Keras. Keras is a package that allows for even simpler operations in TensorFlow than what had been offered earlier. It allows for these cascaded calls of different operations to define each layer. In this example, it's a simple model. We're not doing any convolutions. You can see the operations are labeled dense. Dense means a fully connected layer. A fully connected layer means a matrix of weights that you multiply your image into, a full matrix. Not a convolutional matrix, just full one, right? So the first line in this Keras code is something that's saying layers.flatten. It vectorizes it, yeah. So we have some image. It's the MNIST images. You guys already are very familiar with these, 28 by 28. Pixels, right? I'm not prescribing any dimensions really to the flatten operation in Keras. It knows because it's smart how many dimensions the output's going to be. Uh, you don't need to prescribe that. I'm just saying, hey, the input is 28 by 28. And so the output of that first layer is going to be a vector. The flatten is like a vec operation. And it's going to be 1 by 784, right? 28 squared. So then next, uh, that automatically is going to be input. When you hit go, Keras does all this automatically into a dense layer because I'm telling it to. And the dense layer, all you need to define in each layer of Keras are the size is the size of the output that you want. Nothing about the input. It just knows the input. It figures that out. It's smart. So the output I'm defining, I want it to be 128 
units. Units means rows. <laughs> and the, the number of columns is 784 because otherwise you can't do the matrix multiply that you're prescribing Keras to perform. So then the key next term is activation. Activation equals ReLU. So there, it's our first layer. The flatten doesn't do anything. I'm not applying a nonlinearity to the flattening operation. But here I'm going to apply a nonlinearity. At each layer, generally you have to prescribe a nonlinearity. So that means I'm taking a ReLU after this matrix multiply, right? And then we have a dropout layer. We'll talk about dropout next class. And then we have another dense layer. Right here, again, I'm not saying anything about the input dimensions, but what are going to be the input dimensions to my next layer? 128. Why? Because that's how many rows are here, right? It has to be that dimension. And so we have a 128 input dimension, and then I'm saying there's only 10 on the output dimension. Why 10? That's the number of categories of MNIST digit there are. So 10 is a good choice. If I don't choose 10, then the output of my Keras layer is not going to match the number, the size of each of my labels. The labels we imported up here, we didn't look at their dimensions. But this Y train and Y test, those are each going to have 10 entries because that's the goal of the classification task is to classify into one of 10 examples of handwritten digits. Okay, and so here... This is important. The activation here, we're applying a soft max. Soft max is a sigmoid, just another term for it. Okay. Why do we want to do a soft max? Because, or why don't we want to do a relu there? So for the final layer, we want numbers that are resembling or follow a probability measure because we're at the final stage of saying, hey, this is the guess of the probability of being in each of those 10 categories. And so if you're doing classification, especially on the homework, but also for the final project, the final nonlinearity, you want it to be something that maps the values to between zero and one, something that gives you a probability type output. So softmax is the most common choice there. Okay, so that's it for our model. So that's that whole left side of the column of options I was describing. The right side is this next step, the compile. We haven't really talked about this. We'll talk about it more next class. But we have a choice of optimizer. We have a choice of the loss. What is our ln function? And then we have a choice of how we want to look at the metrics, which is not going to materially impact the optimization process, but is just another parameter we have to define. Okay, So we can execute all this, and we'll talk about these choices in a second. But here, just remember, there's Adam and then the sparse categorical cross-entropy, which essentially is cross-entropy, which is that metric we derived right from the logistic classifier. Okay, so that got it all set up, and now we can run our model. Okay, so we ran the model. I didn't really describe the, the different f parameters you have available to prescribe in the model, but you picked the number as epochs. What do you think an epoch is? So run on the whole set. So in one epoch, every MNIST digit will be observed or input into the network in the training process. So here we're looking at every image five times. So it's effectively like a kind of meta iteration term. Right. It's going to look through all of your training data five times. Or it could be 10 times. It could be 20 times, right? This is something you really need to play with. The more, the better, generally, until you start seeing the loss, which is bad. Okay? But it's something that is a really important parameter to play with. More is better. There's trade-offs in everything. More is better for better performance. More is worse for your time and annoyance and ability to iterate quickly and change things to improve, right? And so it's something you just have to get accustomed to really changing and analyzing. Plotting the loss as a function of epoch during training is a critical tool you should, get, you should use, which we'll get into. Here. And so then our batch size is something we'll talk about next class. That's how many 
each time we update the gradient, how many images are being used to perform that update. That's what's referred to as the batch size. It chunks your input data into little smaller batches. And then validation data, I'll explain later as well. We're just saying it's the test data in this example. Okay. So then we can go ahead and predict our output. So for prediction in this classification task, it's pretty straightforward. We essentially look at the maximum entry of the output vector. And that's true in most classification tasks. So it's, you have a bunch of numbers, 10 numbers, right? An image goes through your network. So we trained a model, and now we want to test it. Right? And so to test it, we have to look at the unseen test data. This is really important. Right? It's not fair to just look at the same training data and say, hey, look, we're doing great, because the network already saw that, so it's biased and knows all those examples. To really assess its performance, you have to show it unseen data. So this is unseen handwritten Im images, which we set aside before when we, lo when we loaded the data in. These test images are going to pass through our model via this dot predict call. That's all it's doing. There's no optimization involved there. We've created a model. The weights are established and fixed and they're in these matrices. And now all we do is we pass the test model into these fixed weights, get a 128 vector after the first layer, and then through the second layer, we get a vector of 10 entries, because all the weights have been established via that optimization of five epochs. And now we get a, an output vector with 10 entries, and I'm saying, hey, tell me the index of the largest value in that vector. Why? Because that's going to be the most probable category of the image as established by this training. So that's what this argmax is. Okay, and so we get a set of predictions and we can look at the incorrect predictions in our test data set by asking for where the prediction vectors do not match the test vectors. Okay. Give me those locations, and this is essentially the uh, mp.where finds the values and gives me those indices, right? Binary operator, so you use the where to cast that binary operator into actual indices to go look at those incorrect examples. And so the incorrect indices are shown down here. Well, we can look at the error rate again. So here, the error rate which is equal to the mean of the incorrect values is 2.7%. So that means in this very simple model with two layers, they're fully connected layers, we were able to get 97.4% accuracy with our classification of 10 numbers, handwritten digits. That's a lot better than you guys did on homework one. I'm almost positive. Why? Because now we are allowing for these nonlinear operations. So just two layers of matrix multiplies with two nonlinearities applied. Gets us from, I don't know what you all had on your homework, probably in the 70, 80 percent range. Exactly. So we're considering 10 here, which is much harder than just looking for two as well. So you can see how easy it is to make a pretty good classifier, right? Again, the MNIST digits are very simple, right? to work with, but gives you an idea. And these are all the incorrect ind indices. So we can go ahead and look at some of the incorrect examples. So this is just plotting. So here, this example here, the ground truth is a nine, the network thought it was an eight. You can see it has eight-like features. Uh, so again, didn't do great between eight and nines, or at least in these quick glances. There's some issue with the thinking nines are uh, actually eights. The ground truth of this is a four, which I saw that I wouldn't know necessarily. I probably guess four though. And then it guessed it was a two, you know. Here I thought it was a zero. Here it thought it was a four. So you can see actually plausible failure cases, right? Not it's not like giving completely unpredictable errors. Which, yeah, ascribes it some sort of intelligence almost. Like when you're just 
not thinking about what's actually happening mathematically. Here, next step, we're going to do a CNN. Okay? So that was a, there's no convolutions here. So to do a CNN, you have to add an additional dimension to your input data. Why do you think that is? So here we have, we're, we've loaded n list digits. They are 28 by 28 pixels, and there's a bunch of examples that comes in as one of the dimensions of the array, but we need to add an extra dimension. Remember at the beginning of this class, I said when you do convolutional neural networks, you have to think of them as three-dimensional. Right? It's not just a two-dimensional convolution when you're actually applying them. We're creating channels. And so you need to add this third dimension always. So whenever you're doing convolutional neural networks, you'll have a third additional dimension that represents the channels. Because you need to add channels when you do CNNs. Okay? So ready for that. So that's something I think people encounter and struggle with. They say, hey, I'm trying to do CNNs, and it's like giving me an error. It's generally because you're not thinking about this channel dimension. You need to add it in. Otherwise, TensorFlow is going to yell at you. So here we've made a new model. It's exactly the same. It's a tf.keras.model.sequential, just like before. And now we have a new term here, layers.conf2d, not the dense one. We have several options. The number of filters. This is the number of channels we're going to create. This can be any number. Here I'm saying it's 16. So this is going to take our input image and create an output that's going to have 16 along the third dimension. The kernel size is up to me. Here it's three. The stride is up to me. One. Padding and relu. Those are all just up to you as well. So we're going to do that twice and we'll get the second one. We'll add more channels. And then we're going to flatten it, just like here. And then we're going to pass it through a fully connected layer, a dense layer. Why do we do that? Because that's what you always do in every classification network. Even a CNN, you'll do some convolutions, but at the end, you need to get your output into a vector, just like we did in the first example, because we need to compare a vector to a vector. The co vector we're comparing to is which category is the image in. So we do that in two steps here. We have a dense layer with 64 instead of 128, and then a second one again with 10. This is exactly the same. We're compiling the exact same model with the same optimizer. OK, and then we can run the convolutional neural network here. We're just doing two epochs. Batch size is the same, 32, and then same validation. So just copied and pasted the other code, really. OK, and then we can look at the prediction. How did we do with our CNN? This is our first CNN. This is exciting. 1% error rate. Wow. Even better by adding two convolutions. Not much better, but it's a percentage better. It's quite good, right? We got 50% of the way closer to 100% than we were before. Ish. It's a diminu law of diminishing returns when you're in the 99, 98, 97 regime. So, yeah, and then at this scale of performance, when you're in the 98, 99, it's hard to really tell benefits or improvements, right? Uh, little changes are going to be swamped out by the statistical variation you're going to observe on run-to-run, -run, trial to trial, data set to data set, right? And so it becomes harder and harder, at least in these examples we're going to be working with in this class where we're just quickly training these models and testing them on smaller data sets. So if you eke out little percentage gains here and there with the MNIST digit set that are above 99%, it's not going to change the world, really. Because you try it again on some other handwritten digits, and it won't be as great, right, for example. OK, but that's it. So you can look at the model size and parameters with this simple dot summary uh, call, which allows you to see what's in each layer, right? So it's getting back to your question about this, what's going on actually, this gives a good way to look at that. You ask uh, TensorFlow to summarize it for you. All right, so next class we will get into this. We will talk about what are some loss functions, 
what are some ways to perform gradient descent? And as you saw, it's all summarized by that model.compile function, and you just change the little terms. It's that easy. Here are a bunch of the loss functions you can choose from. In TensorFlow, there's, this list is certainly not exhaustive. These are just the popular ones. And you just change that, what we had as the sparse categorical cross-entropy, which is useful for classification, to any one of these loss functions, right? There's softmax cross-entropy, weighted cross-entropy. These, these top cross-entropy ones, like I said, are the most popular choices for classification tasks. But as you get into segmentation and object detection, for example, you're considering that for your final project, you'll want to use some of these other loss functions, right? And of course, there's always mean squared error for those of you who want to try something like um, a combination of mean squared error and a L1 loss function, for example, for segmentation. Sometimes it's like not a bad choice. Okay, but those are all just simple one-liner changes. All right, so we'll stop there, pick up these last few things next class.